Otherwise, you'll be back up. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I'm Dr. Sirota Rosenberg. I'm a dermatologist, and uh, I trained here at Good Old St. John's. Um, and I used to be a family practitioner, and I trained up the block at Peninsula. I brought everything I know from there here, and I've been here since 96, and we trained. So I am chair of the department, and um, I am also the program director. And I want to thank my residents for helping put this together for tonight. This is the first keynote speaker for the St. John's Educational um, Community Outreach, and we're really glad that you could join us. Um, you're our main person from the community. <laughs> and, uh, we, uh, a lot of thank you. And, uh, right. A lot so, of people say that I'm the mayor. Yeah, yeah. you're the mayor. <laughs> There's a lot on your shoulders right now. So hopefully you can help take our message out. That's why okay? I came. So we, we, we really have a lot to offer. And, um, you know, that we want to get it out there to the community, what we have here to offer. Good. And, um, you know, we... We invested a lot into this, a lot of time and money to serve the community. And so this is what we're gonna be doing as well. So today we're gonna to talk about, apropos going into this summer, is sun exposure. Just out of curiosity, who has their sunblock or a sunscreen from last summer in their house? 10 years. Brand spanking new. Brand spanking new? What about you? Her household is my household. <laughs> okay. Do you have? I don't use sunscreen. You don't use sunscreen. Do you use sunblock? Sunscreen or sunblock? Oh, yes. My sister would not. I've had lots of skin problems. I've had adnexal tumors. Okay. I've had mold removed constantly. I have a lot of allergies. So, so, okay. so, so we'll I'm, touch on some of that today. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to talk about the benefits of sun exposure that, you know, a lot of people think about, and then also the problems related to the sun exposure. And what can we use? What's the right sun protection that we use? Um, there's a lot of misnomers out there and a lot of misinformation about, not mis misinformation about what's the right thing to use. So, um, let's talk about what the benefits of sun exposure are. Any ideas? Vicky, what would you think? Go ahead. Vitamin D. Vitamin D, okay. Makes you feel happy. Makes you feel happy. Those are the two main things, right? We think about vitamin D exposure, and we think about it improves our mood, right? Everyone in the winter, they're down. I think that's why daylight savings time, there's gonna be, a, there's talk about getting rid of it because we want more light, um, right? And there's seasonal affective disorder. Those are mm -hmm. the things that, you know, affect us. And all of us in this room, I know we've all had that with us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then overall, like, you know, health, heart health, skin health, those are some of the benefits. When it's nice out, you go out and you walk more. You're, t you're more apt to go and do things because the cold weather, the rain, it doesn't stop you. You don't fall as much, things like that. But there's a lot more down to just being, you know, just doing those positives. So how we overcome those positives is other ways that we do it. So vitamin D, you know. What's interesting about vitamin D is that 80 to 90% from the sun that you get, how much time do you need in the sun to actually get um, vitamin D exposure? Ten minutes. What? 10 minutes. How often? So you need 10 to 15 minutes three times a week. That's it. Now, if I asked you that question about how much sunblock do you put on, what's the correct amount of sunblock that you're supposed to put on? Anyone know? Every day. How much? Every day. Every day. How much? I don't know. Whatever comes, whatever comes in with the makeup, that's what yeah. goes. Oh well, that's, that's <laughs> then we're gonna get to that. So you know, um, we're gonna get to how much you really are supposed to be putting on. But vitamin D, it varies on location and the time of day of exposure. It also the body gets rid of any excess vitamin D. So you only need that ten to fifteen minutes three times a week. And the risk of skin cancer, of photoaging, and hyperpigmentation are a lot worse than what people think by going out and I need my vitamin D, I need my vitamin D. But it really doesn't correlate to how much you know. Now, there's a, we don't know today, right? Everybody is virtually vitamin D deficient, right? Yeah. But then I don't think we can even get enough from the sun so, to raise but, the but, numbers. But the other problem is what does that number mean? So many people are vitamin D deficient. Young kids are deficient. You know, if we said that the population who's 60, 70, 80 are vitamin D deficient, but we're talking about younger people as well. So sometimes that relative value, we don't really know what it means. Just like on an allergy test, 
We don't know really what that allergy test relative value means. So you want to think about what do those numbers mean and what can we do to really do the right thing and supplement. So it's activated in the skin by the sun. It travels to the liver where it is metabolized and stored. And then the kidneys where it's converted to the active form and then you pee out the rest. So there's D2 and there's D3. D2 comes from plant sources and D3 comes from the sunlight. The American Academy of Dermatology, who we represent, recommends getting your vitamin D from diet, not from the sun. Okay, so what is the recommended dietary value? It's less than age one is 400 uh, micro, micrograms per day. And then you have one to 70 is 600 micrograms. And then 70 and above is 800 micrograms per day. That's not a real tremendous amount. So if you want to think about it, um, we can talk about what's the best one to do. I'm going to open up my phone because I can't even see that one. But if you think about it, the best source is, which anyone have an idea? So salmon. Salmon gives you 142% of your daily vitamin recommended dose. Um, fortified milk, all, all milk is fortified now. Fortified tofu, uh, fortified breakfast cereals. That's why it says, you know, recommended daily uh, dosage of, of vitamins is what they want. So you can get for a three quarters of a cup, your 12% for, from the fortified cereals. Pork chops, 10%. Cremini mushrooms, for your vegetarians, gives you 140, 139% per cup. 19 calories. So you're not asking someone to eat a lot of fit, you know, a lot of product to get what they need. On the salmon, a six ounce filet gives you 142% of the recommended daily dose that's only 265 calories. So you're not talking about a lot. Fortified yogurt gives it to you, uh, fortified orange juice and eggs. So those are some of the ideas that you wanna think about when you are recommending about vitamin D. Now, two medical conditions that we use to light sources to treat, and we have them available here in the clinic, right? Is psoriasis and vitiligo. So, you can say to a patient, go out and expose yourself, but that's a very broad band. And here in the clinic, we offer narrow band UVB. And that is a very small targeted wavelength and it mimics sunlight. And what it does is it prevents and it helps you not be exposed to the skin cancer and harmful rays that you would being outside. So on psoriasis, um, when the, the cells replicate very fast, you get these psoriatic plaques and what sunlight does is it helps synthesize vitamin D, which inhibits many of the inflammatory mediators um, involved in psoriasis. But we have vitamin D analogs in creams, calcipatrion, that we prescribe to our patients to treat this. Because you're never gonna hear me really say, go out and expose yourself to the sun so that you can get it. The risk of skin cancer and aging is just too great. So you're not gonna hear me. Now, if somebody's gonna argue with me, I might say to them, you wanna go out for 10, 15 minutes in the morning before 10 o'clock or after five, I'll accept that a little bit, but 10 minutes, I'm not accepting much more than that. Um, so, you know, again, five to 10 minutes, maybe you can do that, um, but you have to wear also sunscreen in the unaffected areas. For vitiligo, it's a, a disease of a hypopigmentation, right? And this pigmentation where the, it's an autoimmune condition and you lose the melanocyte production in the skin. What sunlight does, again, where we could use our narrow band UVB targeting, is to stimulate production of the melanocytes, which are those pigment producing cells. And it's controlled, we control the amount that we can do that for. Eczema, you know, you'll hear over the, kid, over the summer, kids will say that their eczema is better or they'll say it's worse. Why would it be worse? They're in the water a lot they're constantly wet, they're sweating, that will make it worse. Sunlight can, in certain times, make it better. Again, what we would control with narrow band UVB or the photo booth. When we put somebody in the photo booth here, yeah, they're in for two and a half minutes, three minutes the most. And it's controlled. It's a controlled amount of sunlight that we get. So eczema being the itch that rashes, it's a chronic condition of dry, itchy, inflamed skin. 
What sunlight does is increase the vitamin D in the skin and it inhibits the immune response. It improves, it helps to improve the skin barrier so that the medication can penetrate um, and it also heal on itself. We like our body to do heal thyself first and we really work with that. Very often you guys will send patients to us and the first thing we do, and I had this today, was that taking, the mom said, they take two showers a day, the kids, morning and night. All well, three kids are flared with eczema. I'm not gonna get it under control with two showers a day. You know, so those are some of the things that you wanna think about where sunlight can help, but again, in a controlled environment. So what are the bad things? We give you that nice problems related to the sun exposure. So dehydration. So being dehydration, right, you're out, you're sweating, you're thinking about it occurs when you lose more fluid than you intake, that you're drinking. And you know, it's nice now because um, water is always pushed, water, water, water. But sometimes you're losing also in sweat, you're losing electrolytes. And if you're not replacing um, electrolytes, that's when you get into trouble. And that's when you could see, especially somebody who's drinking a lot of water, a dilutional hyponatremia where their sodiums drop. More common in the summer, more common in have runners, thing, people that are doing things that are just or new runners, new activity people that are drinking just water and not taking their electrolytes. So you'll feel thirsty as the first symptom. You'll stop urinating. Um, you'll have weakness, headache, uh, muscle cramps, dizziness. People get confused. And if you've ever seen it, I'll tell you where you can see it is on, if you ever watch the marathon, right? You see what happens to the marathon runners. Some of them lose their bowels, they lose their ability, they lose all that control. They're sweating so much, they come in, they're confused, they're stammering, they don't make it, people are carrying them. That starts with dehydration of what's happened to them and as well as heat exhaustion if it's hot. So um, moving from dehydration, what happens also is you can elevate your temperatures, your body temperatures, and then you know, you're getting into, and it's a cycle because you stop drinking because you're confused and you're not realizing. So if we talk about heat exhaustion, that's like a further step, right? And you have, it's caused by too much heat and dehydration. It can lead to real serious problems. Symptoms are heavy sweating, weakness, fainting, fatigue, cramps, cold and clammy skin, thirsty again, um, and a faster weak pulse. And these are the very common, then people start to vomit. You would think, why are they vomiting? That's a normal reaction. Um, if you suspect heat exhaustion, you know, hydrate, cool the person down, call 911 because they very often need an IV fluid. The worst being of all of that is heat stroke. Heat stroke is that end stage after heat exhaustion where you're ending up, um, your body temperatures go sky high. So I had a kid when I was in camp, being I was a camp physician, sleep away camp, and it was a hundred degree day and they had hockey tournaments going on. And the kids were told you could only play in the morning or you could play in the afternoon. So you played regular hockey in the morning, um, you know, as a player. And in the afternoon, he went in as the goalie. And he had a mask on, so, so no, nobody realized it was him. Of course, it was foolish. And all of a sudden, I got a call. I had to get to him. His temperature was at 107. He was completely dehydrated. He had, you know, rhabdomyolysis. We had to hospitalize him. Here I'm in camp, I'm the camp doctor. The parents are, you know, four hours away. Um, and that, what, he was very lucky that he didn't stroke out or lose his kidneys because he went into that. So his muscles were breaking down and hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, cool them, put in cold bath, cold shower, you know, all different things. So, you know, you wanna distinguish between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. But we're, we don't expect everyone out there. So the best thing is call 911 to get help and hydrate. What you can do is add the cold, add the water, make sure things like that. So another negative that you have from sun exposure is skin cancer risk. So UV rays from sun exposure can lead to skin cancer. They, they cause DNA, DNA dimer change and they affect it at the level inside intracellularly and they cause stimulation of the basal cell squamous cells or the melanocytes. And one of every five Americans will develop some type of skin cancer by the time uh, they're age 70. It's more common in your elderly, fair skin type, red hair, uh, transplant patients, 
and those who have a prior strong history. In our skin of color patients, don't think that you don't need sunblock and don't think that you can't get skin cancer. Right now, we see a lot in the clinic, we see in our Hispanic patients, we see in our Asian, a lot of uh, cross cultures now has taken place. There's a lot of interracial. So nobody anymore is all black or all Asian or all white. There's a lot of mix. So when you're having that, you have to think about how things are affect your skin. And in skin of color, we also are very often watch for the hands because the acrolytiginous melanoma is most common. And that you can think of Bob Marley who died of melanoma of the toe. And he was what, 27 when he died? I think he was, yeah, he was in his 30s. Okay, uh, 37, yeah. he, very young, yep. okay? So you would think, why would you know, a black guy have this? But it does, and you, we can't be remiss not to think of skin disease and skin cancers in our patients. And we see in the clinic, we've seen pigmented basal cells, squamous cells. So those are the things to think about. So there's three main forms. We talk about basal cells, squamous cell, and melanoma, and those are all defined by the, the type of cell that it is. So basal cells, the basal layer, the squamous is the squamous layer, and melanoma, the melanocyte. And of course, the most deadly is melanoma that we know of, but early detection is really what's important. And what I just gave and showed you guys, you know, and I think we have another slide on it, we'll get to, is what helps us define and alert the public to what it, what these defining characteristics are. So basal cell is the most common type of skin cancer. It represents, it's about 80% of all skin cancers. It's locally destructive, it's rarely metastatic, but it's locally <coughs> destructive means bad. We have seen, especially in our nursing home patients, be it negligence, be it more that they refuse treatment, and there's nobody there watching out for them. They have, you know, ulcerating masses that you have been affected that are basal cells. And so it's, um, it's rarely life-threatening. It can be anywhere on the body, but it's most common in um, skin and sun-bearing areas. So you think it's usually you see more than one, and usually it's ears, nose, mouth, face, hands, arms, and lower legs. Squamous cell is another common type. This one does have a propensity to metastasize if not caught right or in the wrong area. So an area like around here where it can drain into the lymph nodes is a more serious area than elsewhere. It's um, rarely life-threatening, but it can be. One of my very first clinic patients here died of squamous cell <coughs> from 22 years ago. Um, these lesions may begin as red scaly patches, um, on some damaged skin, and that's known as actinic keratosis. And when you all see us with those cans spraying, we're spraying those actinic keratosis. Um, it fully developed, it may go on to be a red bump or ulcerated in the center. And then lastly, the, of the three main ones, because there's others like, you know, Merkel cell or apocrine ones, there's different ones. Melanoma is the most serious and the most deadly form. It's about 4% of all new skin cancers. The earlier melanoma is detected, the higher the cure rate. Um, if left to, grow, left to grow, it can be extremely deadly and fatal. And it may originate from a mole um, that's been there for many years, and then we use the criteria of the ABCs. And so the ABCs are on those things that I gave you. And they are, A, A is for asymmetry, B is for irregular borders, C is for multiple colors, D is for diameter greater than a quarter of an inch which is like a pencil top uh, eraser, and E is for anything that's evolved or changed. And this is a simple, easy way of knowing if I have to worry about something, you know? And it's interesting, the, uh, Amer the United States Task Force just came out two months ago, again, saying that body checks don't prove enough to be done to be covered by, you know, health insurance. Health insurance. And the reason is they, they want everyone to know this and they kind of think that if um, if it's spotted, you know, a family member can spot it and you can come in and have your doctor look at what it is. So it's a little bit difficult. There is no code for a body check. So it, it's a little bit of a controversy. So the prevention <coughs> is key in all of these skin cancers. So how do we protect ourselves? Uh, sunscreen. 
limiting sun exposure during the hours of 10 to 5. Um, and also protective clothing now, high weave rather than light t-shirts or thin t-shirts. Seek out your dermatologist to get checked if you have anything that you're concerned about. Um, if you notice anything that's non-healing, a pimple that's non-healing is more likely gonna be a basal cell, a, a sore, and also that's not healing or growing. They, you know, as, as providers and as, you know, your own, these are the things. Um, and send them over because they can be treated fairly easily in the beginning and then they become more and more, you know, um, troubled and difficult to treat. And we have stuff from in the office to all the way now to pills, you know, targeted immunotherapy <coughs> as such. So sun protection. We have a bunch of nice products for everyone that we have available here to you. Um, and then there's others. But there's two types of uh, sun protection that we're gonna talk about, right? So the first thing that we as, as germs want very specifically is we want fragrance-free, we want hypoallergenic and dermatology tested. Um, you know, we don't want it just from the actress or the actor or anybody. We really want you to use good products and there's a reason why. So we have two types of sunscreens. There's physical sunscreen, is sunscreen or sunblock, what we call, and then we have a chemical sunscreen. And so we try to use the name sunblock versus sunscreen. And why is this important? Because a physical sunscreen will uh, prevent UV rays from entering into your body. Whereas a chemical lets them enter and get changed and reflect out. So it's two, one reflects it out and one absorbs and changes it. So you can imagine what I like. I like a physical blocker. I don't want you absorbing anything in. And they don't work quite as well. And so what happens is your sunscreens really only go up to SPF 30. Does anyone know what SPF means? Sun protective factor. Right. So, what does that really mean? It's um, the like the ratio of something of how long it would be after a certain amount of time, kind of thing. Before you <clears throat> burn. Ah, okay. People forget that they think a sun block or sunscreen of thirty means I can be out all day because I don't burn. It doesn't mean it means that, and it's not really thirty times longer. But like for me, I if I'm outside, I burn in in twenty minutes. So if I use a sunblock 30, I might be out for 60 minutes before I burn. Because it, it breaks down, it metabolizes, it breaks down, and it's not effective anymore. So sunblock has to be reapplied every two hours before it breaks down. That is really important for your patients and your friends and your families to know and yourself. It has to be reapplied. I promise you'll still get some color, but it does have to be reapplied. Even, you can't say waterproof anymore, You say, we say water resistant, it has to be reapplied. So, if you're thinking about um, your physical sunscreens, those are your minerals, that's um, titanium and zinc oxide. Titanium dioxide and zinc, uh, zinc oxide. And in skin of color, it's important to use the tinted. So the problem is a lot of people with skin of color don't like the tint. So if you look at the ones that we have from Elta, you'll see that we have this varying tint and they're neutral tints so that they don't change your skin tone even though that they're tinted. And you know, all different companies now have put them out. Um, we like Elta because it's not comedogenic, it doesn't cause you to break out, it has no allergies to it, and it, it's a higher grade level and made. So your chemical sunscreens are your um, oxybenzone, your avobenzone, octinoxinate, homonoxinate, all these different fancy ones, which you might have heard have caused some damage to the coral reef. So we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, what you look for is on the back of the labels and what we always want you to see, or here I will tell you, right? is on it will tell you. So this says titanium 7.2% and zinc 9.0%. Most people didn't want to use these products because they thought they were putting on desitin, right? <coughs> desitin is 20% zinc or 42% zinc. It's like putting on, looking at the lifeguard with the white nose. We don't have to do that anymore. They're all micronized and they've been shown to show how they can uh, put on without a white film. 
and they're tinted. And the reason why we like tinted is because it has iron oxide. And iron oxide has been shown to help prevent, prevent melasma in our skin of color patients or even in our light patients who get melasma. So it's something really important. Anything below 30 gives you no um, UVB protection. It's only UVA, right? Yes, UVA. And then anything above 30 will give you. And what's the difference between UVA and UVB? UVB is your burning rays. UVA is your aging rays. So that immediate burn is UVB and your long-term, the next day, you, you don't get burnt that day, you show up the next day and you're burnt, that's your UVA. And they're both equally damaging. What are tanning salons? What are those tanning booths? They tell yeah. you they're not, what? Yeah. What are they? They're UVA. They're UVA. That's how they got away with saying that they're not UVB so they don't cause skin cancer. And we know that's wrong. Why are tanning booths, so I'll give you another number. What the most common skin cancer, rise in skin cancer, melanoma, is it was in who? Do you know who it used to be in? It's better now. It used to be in teenage girls, yeah, starting 16 to like 39. And the reason why was they were of the tanning booths. And they were going and they purposely put the tanning booths by the high schools, because at the time that it started, you did not need parental consent. Mm -hmm. It's addictive. When you sit in the sun and you, re you release pheromones, it's an addictive behavior and people love it. It makes them feel good. It's like what we said in the beginning, why you feel good. And what, ha what happened is it's a five, this was already 15 years ago, it was a $5 billion industry per year. So the fastest rise in skin cancer was among those teenage girls that became now women. So we're seeing it in 30s and 40s, which it shouldn't be. Normally we used to see cancers, we, we look at our, our population over here, right? We see they're in the older population, but why are we seeing it in these younger girls? Mostly girls, because they were addicted to that tanning. So now you're not allowed to do that. Um, laws have been passed. The AAD and the AOCD all educated for laws to be passed that you can't sign, you can't go in without parental consent under 18, and they're not allowed to be really by schools. They have to be a certain feet away from schools. So you don't see them around the schools anymore. And all their names were fun names, beach bombs, you know, things like that. So, you know, it's really important to know the history of why that happened. I never liked them. <laughs> well, it's disgusting. Yeah, I yeah. never liked yeah. them. It's it not clean. <laughs> yeah. it's number one. They used to spray it with fantastic yeah. if it's clean. So, um, so I, I told you about the chemical sunscreens versus physical, the difference between yeah. them. So let's talk about the coral reefs. So about two years ago, they came out that the coral reefs were all dying, and it's from sunscreen, not sunblock, sunscreen, right? So not zinc or, or um, titanium but from the, the chemicals. So that showed up in a study um, in vitro, but not in vivo, not live. They really have not been able to correlate it. But if you go to Hawaii or you go to California, you could go to certain beaches. I was away, where was I? And it says you're not allowed to use those sunscreens because they don't want it in the coral reef. But there hasn't been a direct correlation from the, the in vitro lab studies into the other studies. So we then talk about, you know, what are the best sunscreens? So let's go back to the other question. I think I'm almost done, but let's go back to the question that you have your sun bottle, sunscreen bottle from last summer still, and you're using it. Not even just last summer. Lots of stuff. Lots 10 years. Of summer. Okay. Yeah, so, so that means you're I just figured they're, they're not as potent. <laughs> But they're better than nothing. <laughs> True, but it's time to buy a new one. Okay. <laughs> and you know, we happen to have it right here for you. So, how much sunscreen for somebody's body are you supposed to use? If you're going to the beach, how much sunscreen are you supposed to use? Two tablespoons. No. Two, two tablespoons. Yeah. Yeah, but there, there's a pretty much. Like a universal. 
there's pretty much a universal thing, and that is one to two ounces. That's a shot glass. Mm -hmm. Every time you put on sunblock, you are supposed to be covering your body with a shot glass. So your 12 ounce bottle really oh. should have gone only for six <laughs> ounces for your body. I don't do beach. You know, oh, it's like, Just guess what? Beach. It's not beach. about beach. Walking down. It's not about no, beach. It's, all it's all putting it on your arms yeah, before you leave the house. Yeah. Because yeah. guess what? It comes right through so your so car window. The rays come right through your car window. Your office. It comes through your office. You sit, you have a beautiful, well, your window's under the trestle, so you don't see my side. So, maybe yours. But it comes right through. No beach. Okay, look at your arm. Put your arm here. No, no. Put your arm to your belly. Look at the difference in the two okay. color. But look at this. My legs yes. So look at this beautiful body. Look. You notice that you have no marks. Look at your hand. Look at all these marks. Right? That's now look at your belly. My legs are See? So my legs See? Are so because of that, we're exposing ourselves. So your body is supposed to look like your belly. Right? All of these brown marks on your arm is sun damage. So although you don't think you're getting sun, even walking to the, you know, your body, when we do body checks, right, CJ? You know, Dr. Mancusa will tell you right here, when we do body checks, everybody's breasts, genitalia, touch, look very different than the rest of their bodies. And in skin of color, too. And I know that because I get dark very fast. Right. Mm -hmm. People that know me have been walking with me going, damn, you're that dark already? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you need sunblock on. Yes. It's a, it's a fallacy to sure. But think about the amount that you really need to put on. So, you know, it, it really is like a bottle. <laughs> and a spray. Let me tell you about a spray. Notice we don't have a spray here, right? Because you know what? Go to the beach and watch the person next to you put it on the spray. And all of a sudden, you see it all over, the plume. So, you know, you really got to think. The way to spray for spray is spraying it into your hand and then rubbing it on. Or spraying it like this close and then rubbing it on. Not like, really? <laughs> so those are some things. So we bring the shot glass to the beach. Right. <laughs> so really, by <laughs> you, you do anyway. Most of you bring the Don Julio with you. Right. So there's some really nice, you know, and then we have our babies, and babies should really be in physical blockers as well. And we talk about um, who did that? Me. We talk about. Oh, I hit the wrong button. So we talk about with babies, you want clean, healthy products. And there's lots of them that you can have. You have Baby Balm, you have Eucerin, you have Neutrogena. They all have clean and free. Um, what else they have? There's California Babies. Cerave. There's Sheer Zinc. What? CeraVe. CeraVe, Cetaphil. They all have specific ones for babies that are, have very little fragrance in it. And they have physical blockers. Because babies dehydrate quickly. They burn quickly, their skins are not seasoned, and as such. The worst sunscreens, Banana Boat, it's an aerosol spray. It potentially has a lot of irritating ingredients. Copper Tone, also aerosol, um, and Copper Tone Complete is a chemical sunscreen. It's got fragrance, and it has a lot of irritating ingredients. So does apply, applying sunscreen hurt the environment? So I just told you. The study suggesting oxybenzone and other chemical UV filters may potentially harm the environment. The coral reefs is limited to laboratory data and does not represent real world options. Um, therefore, the data is inconclusive. We do know that there is strong data to support the use of sunscreens as one part in our sun, sun protection strategy. Seek shade, use umbrellas, I love going to the beach, but I do like going at four or five o'clock. And if I'm off on a Sunday and I go for the day, I'm sitting under an umbrella all day. There was a study recently done that shows that people under the umbrella, what? We're still the getting burnt. The sand, it reflects. So up. sand reflection, and they were falsely thinking they were protected and didn't have to put sunblock on. It was two reasons. <coughs> Sorry. So. You, what you want to know is, you know, be aware of that. The other thing is a study recently done did show that the higher SPFs do make a difference. They did a dual foot, uh, split study. One face had 30, one side had 100 SPF, and the 100 did better. 
so that the FDA is still working on what's the right thing to call it. So in summary, I touched upon the benefits of the sun exposure, but I told you how those benefits can be gained through diet, through controlled UVB, you know, exposure through, you know, the lasers that we have. And then also about treatment of, you know, your psoriasis and vitiligo, your vitamin D, much better to get through food. And then we spoke about really the potential of danger. The only thing I did not touch about on a part um, is the <coughs> aging factor from sun exposure. And you could take, there's a very famous picture uh, of this bus, uh, maybe you can look it up, of this truck driver. Um, you know which one I'm talking about? I've shown it to you. He, um, he drives a truck. He was driving a truck for 40 years or 30 years. He's a little older than me, so it's not that old, right? I'm going to show you the picture of him. It, it, uh, it's the truck driver's sun exposure. It's a well-known picture yeah. of the difference between the two sides of his face. This side is the damage from... Yeah. Here, you can look at this. The, the left side is the damage from his driver's side. Okay, you see that? And the right side, look how good that looks on the right side. Maybe he looks like, well, not really, hopefully not, but I don't look that age. But you know what? 28 years of sun damage, this is what it looks like, driving a truck right through the window. So if we think it doesn't do aging, we're all very sadly mistaken. We think a tan makes us look good and glow and look healthy. Our motto is pale is beautiful. It's not, you know, you need to not have that kind of sun exposure. It's just, this. there's no other picture that describes it better than that. Okay? Two ounces for your body. <laughs> I don't go to the beach, I don't go outside, so. Right, but, you know, you need it like on your you know, shirt. Don't look at this. When you leave it like, <laughs> and now, you know, there's other things too. There's um, like makeup brushes that have, uh, you know, um, sunblock in them that you can put right over your makeup. Don't, you gotta reapply. If there's anything you get out of today is reapplying. Reapplying. Every two hours. Every two hours. If you're, especially if you're outside. If, if you're outside. You know, look, if you're inside working, I'm not gonna tell you to reapply it every two hours, but if you're outside for the day, you need to reapply. And a, a hazy day doesn't mean no application. No. The rays still come through. They actually, sometimes you, you don't even realize they're even stronger because that haze is gone. Okay. Any Thank questions? Oh. I do have a question. You had said earlier about the eczema and the kids taking two showers a day. Can you elaborate on that? What's better? Or is it bad because they take two yes. showers a day? Yes. So less showers, but yes. what would you do for them? What, what is good okay. for eczema for children? So, so understand the disease. How dirty are the kids? Think about it. How dirty are we all? Real, are you that dirty? No. Kids, you know, yes, if they're in daycare or they're, you know, they're at school and they're sweating and they're playing ball, they come home, they shower. They don't need to wake up in the morning and take a shower. The, the biggest part of eczema is the skin barrier. Okay, so what does water do and showering do? It breaks down the skin barrier, it doesn't help it. There is a, a thought from years ago that some doctors still do and where you, they used to wrap you in soaps, right? So somebody with really bad eczema in pain with fissures, yeah, you could wrap them in soaps, put clothing <coughs> over it and then hydrate them with Aquaphor, Vaseline, Eucerin healing, Cetaphil healing ointment afterwards, and steroid cream, right, or ointment. So that's what you would do to repair the, heal, the skin barrier first. These three hour showers, two hours, you know, bath, an hour bath, because my kid likes it, my kid, yeah, let them play for 10, 15 minutes. Calm them down, because we all went through that. I have five kids, I knew bath time was always, but I never did every day. It was always every other day. If a, if a baby has an accident, you know, and you have to bathe them, of course you can. Or you wipe them down with the wipes that are, or gentle wipes, 
clean the areas. You can take a washcloth, clean under the neck, the armpits where they're crawling and all. But somebody with bad eczema, most of the time, we can get them better without putting them on medicine if their skin hygiene is taken care of. When we say skin hygiene, we don't mean it being dirty. We mean just skin hygiene and the proper care for your skin. <coughs> you don't want to, you're reinforcing breaking down the skin barrier. We don't want that. There's something called transepidermal water loss, and it's just made worse in eczema. So you want to treat the eczema. Is there any, um, I've heard both both sides of it, and um, people saying, um, one of them was an employee here, and she said that um, she was taught to just pat dry her daughter before yes. putting on all the cream, let some of the moisture, moisture be there. Yes, you can and do I that. And I suggested it to a family member because they're going <coughs> through that, and she said, the pediatrician never told me that. And I said, well, just, just ask so right. that we know. You can do but that. <laughs> you can do that. You know, soaps have a different characteristic to them. There's different types of soap. So soap, when you first put it on, you know, it's in a bar, it's not foamy. The longer you use it and, and rub, it becomes foamy right and then there's your lotion ones like your dove your cerave those that are more foamy and more lubricating though those are better to use on those patients and when they come out then you have them put on your healing ointments and we'll, we'll tell them pat dry people think sometimes out of naivety and, and out of ignorance not in a bad way that they can rub off eczema or rub we've seen babies where the parent thinks that the baby is dirty. So they keep rubbing, rubbing. <coughs> Skin doesn't like to be rubbed. The more you rub, the thicker it gets. So if you think about eczema, those big patches that, that get um, have a lot of lines on them and all, and thickening, that's from rubbing. Crawling on your knees, right? So eczema and uh, psoriasis are two conditions that the babies like, you know, or people crawling on their knees, workers, who lean on their knees, the psoriasis gets, the plaque gets thicker and thicker. Those are the common things that happen. But a lot, you know, new mothers and fathers don't know, they think their babies are dirty, so they're bathing them two, three times a day. They're rubbing them, they're wiping off, they're not getting anywhere. They're making it worse. We had a baby in the clinic, and I felt bad, the mother was really very upset. She's like, I didn't know, and the baby was raw, raw. And we, I don't know if it was before you. Yeah. It was on the fifth floor. But when we stopped the mother, I'm telling you, two weeks later, it was a different child that came in. So, you know, those she are things. Yeah. Know. Now, there's something called bleach baths that we do also. We'll tell a child with eczema that has a lot of staph or strep on the skin, a secondary infection, or they're really crusted, they could do a bleach bath, and you take a... a a tub of water, you put in like a half a cup of bleach. Yeah. Okay. Why? Do you go in a swimming pool? No. Do you go in a swimming pool? I'm not saying it. that. I used to take beach baths. Beach baths. My kids, I, they went outside, they played. I brought them in. But the I put them in, 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 in it, it, it's an astringent. It just cleans the skin. It's like yeah. being in a pool. So we've done that too, but we don't keep them in for hours. We keep them in for, you know, 15 minutes. And that, that, that so there's a controversy now. So, they were doing bleach baths for years, and then a few years ago, they said no bleach baths, but now people are back to bleach baths, and they, they help the skin. You come out, and then you must lubricate when you come out. You can't come out, pat dry, and, not, and let the, the kid go, or anybody go. You've got to lubricate. you got to seal in that water and, and do that, and that's fine. But not every pediatrician, not every doctor is going to go take the time and go through skin hygiene. That's why you have us. And we do this kind of thing to educate. A very good friend of mine, her children, eczema starting where it usually started when African Americans were hiding the needles and went on their neck. She changed their diet. So they became vegetarian and took it a step further. Vegan. No eczema anymore. So the, there is a subset that that can work for where the eczema is sensitive to gluten or to dairy. Same with acne. But it's not something we generalize and tell every patient. So if a patient came in and said that, you know, I noticed every time I eat uh, pizza, I break out. So foods with high glycemic index will cause you to break out. Not every single person, because everybody would be walking around. 
that you know and we see people with all different BMIs and all different mm -hmm. things and it's not broken out or well, you BMI know my stuff is out the window well they just came yeah. out they, they just came out a few days ago to yeah. say that well I I will we'll see it's but your daughter but everybody child just, let me just really tell bad. you but everybody has if there's a family sensitivity you know then that's yeah. what it is and so um, African-Americans with moles um, they usually, well, I know they run in my family, on my father's side of the family. For Melanoma Month last month, I put the question on our family Facebook page, count your moles, how many do you have? One of my cousins typed back, some mornings she feels like a chocolate chip cookie. Oh. When she looks in the mirror, because right. she has so many. She has like, we call her mountain range. Right, she, but those are different. But, but those are different. But also need to be checked. And Correct. what you were talking about with health insurance, how health insurance generally they have to take them off then test them to see if they're cancerous and if they're not most health insurance considers them to be cosmetic so you're going crazy so so again that's why you need a doctor because not every mole or not every you know the ones you're talking about are, are DPNs yeah. and those don't change into anything just they're unsightly um, uh, dermatosis papulosa nigra, and they are covered by insurance. I have um, mine checked every year. Yeah, from head to but toe. checking is different than removing them right. because then, you don't like them. No, those don't change. Only certain ones, more right. of the ones that are like skin tags and get clothes right. or something. So none of that is covered by insurance because nope. it's deemed cosmetic, and that's why I show you this because the ABCDs. It doesn't matter what skin type you are okay. or skin color. These are the things that alert us to if something is not correct. Thank you. All righty. So yeah, I was going to say. Looking ones. Oh, strawberry looking ones. Those are vascular angiomas. Um, unless something is red and has a pearly papule to it, okay. strawberry, those are all angiomas and those are benign. So I was going to say, I actually get, have melanoma run in my family and I get checks every year, full body check. And there was one year that they found something and they removed it, biopsied it. And although it wasn't cancerous at the moment, they said it could turn into that. So it was removed and Further. that was covered by insurance. Right, correct. Because correct. It, that yeah, is. yeah, because it was precancerous. And you had a family history. Yep. Yeah. So unfortunately, I can't answer for the insurance companies. I only know what I, you know, they cover and not cover and what we fight for. And then you guys know that side how much we're covering and fighting for it. So we need more patients to advocate against the insurance companies and what they're doing. You know, there's no reason a cream that 10 years ago was $20 is now 600. There's just no reason for it, so. Just say you're creamy. Well, yeah, but you know, so those are the things. So I know it's late and everyone wants to get home. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.